I did want to blitz through some of these games and also ask you guys some questions in the meantime. So I have some, I'm going to dump some notes on you guys and ask you guys some questions. So uh, our Belgium's 3-1 win over Estonia. Hazard played in that game. I said Courtois. And if you look, it's one of those ones that like, you know, on Twitter, like people just do that thing, like on football Twitter, where they'll be like Eden Hazard versus Estonia. And then they'll put like three key, two key passes. And they put all, they'll list all the stats. They'll put an emoji beside each one. I don't even know what the emojis mean. And it gets shared, <laughs> retweeted. No one really understands. They didn't, they didn't watch the game. Um, so I watched that Eden Hazard performance. And I, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it was bad. I actually thought it was pretty good. But it was one of those things that, like, I think if you're playing against Estonia, Estonia, I just expected a little bit more. Um, a lot of his performance in this game was just get the ball and play the simple pass and then recycle possession, get the ball back. It was just like a classic 10 roll. And he had two really good chances. One really, really good chance on a break, which he just fluffed. Another one where he shot at the keeper. He didn't look very hungry in front of goal. And then the other... The other times, I just feel like he he's not he doesn't take players on anymore. He does not what he does. It's just not mm-hmm. in his game. He doesn't take players on. So it, it, it's almost like he's playing this ten role, which can work with the Belgium national team. And it's not an exact ten. Like he this, with Belgium as he as he usually does, he plays uh, at the front attacking slot with Yannick Carrasco taking the left wing back slot, and he does more. Carrasco does the more of the dirty work, two way winger stuff, defends, attacks takes the wing and Hazard just kind of roams in the middle and gets the ball and distributes. It's fine if you want to play him in that role. I don't, I don't mind it. I just, my concern is that part of the reason why he can do that with Belgium is because it's, it's Belgium and that role can be made for him. If with Real Madrid, you just can't have that role the way that Ancelotti draws things up. If you're going to put him in the central midfield spot, it makes no sense because he can't defend if you're going to put him on the right wing, sure, I guess maybe, but he's not going to take players on the way like a Rodrigo would. Um, and you can't put him on the left because Vinicius is there. My only, th- the my honest feeling is that the only role that exists for Matt Real Madrid now at this stage of his career is like a backup to Benzema as a false nine. I think he can play that role, but I just he's also not going to score goals for like the way Benzema. So I'm just curious. Maybe we can start with you, Jose. What is your read uh-huh. on this whole Hazard thing? How can he be of use of Real Madrid? Like, is there is there a way we can maximize his his um, his performances? Whew. That is a tough one. And yes, I've also noticed. I noticed uh, um, uh, his performances also during the Nations League. And I remember there was what there. I th- there was one where people were kind of hyping him up, and I'm like, I don't see what exactly is there to hype up here like I don't because a a lot of the time Asad had better performances with Belgium than with Real Madrid but here I it didn't seem like anything different from what he'd been doing with Real Madrid and like you mentioned uh, on the dribbling side of things it's not promising Uh, Asad was fundamentally a dribbler the thing that made him stand out the basis of his entire game was dribbling and now that he's kind of lost that um, it's there's a lot of reinvention that will have to happen with Asad. And right now, yes, you basically give him the, the only thing you can do is like you mentioned, just kind of play him as a 10 uh, that uh, kind of, that links up, does like nice, nice quick passes with, with, with the rest of the attack. But uh, in, in the case of Real Madrid, it's really hard to find, to find a role for him at more to find a role for him at the moment. Uh, and yeah, it's a, unless, unless Ancelotti wants to play at some point of four, two, three, one, I, yeah, I, str- I really struggle to see it or, you know, just as a backup, <laughs> as a backup to Vinicius, but that's about it uh, there. Yeah. Uh, it, it It's really hard. And it, and I also don't see like a pathway to recover the player's confidence and to get him uh, and to get him into a good straight. Cause right now there's just zero re like, there's just no reason to give him minutes when you have in mind Vinicius being maybe the best uh, forward part, uh, duo uh, in the world right now in terms of how, how informed they are. So mm, it's, I don't see it. I just don't see it.
Mehdi, you got, I'm sure you got some thoughts on this. You're the, you're the, didn't you have something with Hazard and drinking at some point? Jinxing? Yeah, I yeah. was, I was, I was trying so hard to avoid this, but here we are, but I will avoid saying his name. So Jose, if, if you don't know this, I'm pretty sure you don't. So I have this thing until Real Madrid's number seven scores his next goal for Real Madrid. I'm not saying his name. So it's 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 been a while. I, I refer to him as Belgium's captain or Belgian winger or number seven like that. Right. So I think, uh, I, I don't even think that he can be a backup for Vinicius at this point because yeah. the kind of game he, game he is attributed to at the moment, uh, if he comes on for Vinicius, then we are actually having to change change our tactics a little bit. We can't yes. play the same tactics because he can't. He is not going to take players on. He's not going to make those cutbacks from left to right. So, uh, yeah, I think even more so, Real Madrid is not in a state where they can allow him minutes just to regain him just to regain his confidence because we're not like nine points or ten points ahead of the second team in the league. We're not even like the first team in the league ourselves. We've, we have struggled in the Champions League here and there as well. So for us, it's imperative for Ancelotti to, I think, uh, field his best 11 in most games. But I think at one stage of the this season, if and I hope that we do. If we get to a comfortable situation, position into in the league, at least, and we also will have, have the Copa del Rey for that. Uh, I keep going back to this over and over again in many of my football discussions that what Zidane did in 2016-17 with that A-team, B-team thing, it was, it was pretty beautiful from a squad management perspective. If Ancelotti gets that room in the scoreboard, in the leaderboard at any stage of season, then probably he can play as the main striker in, in a few games. Otherwise, I think his only position at the moment is uh, is backup to Benzema. Uh, but even then, like I would prefer Gareth Bale as the first backup to Karim Benzema, to be honest, because Bale adds something aerially. Because uh, and uh, like our number seven doesn't add anything aerially. So and the kind of game we games that we play, uh, cross are a big part of our you know final phase buildup. So uh, I think I, I would prefer Bale to be Benzema's first backup if he is fit and he, if Bale's not starting. So I think I think uh, he's he's pretty much down the pecking order in Real Madrid's forward line at the moment. Uh-huh. I, I, honestly, any time. <laughs> Anytime we have a discussion about lineups and who should play where, honestly, I just forget about Bale, the, the fact that he's in the squad. But I actually think that that makes sense. I, I think he you, he's reliable finishing for the most part. I think if you put him in that situation, he's probably going to put the ball in the back of that more, or at least more likely than Hazard is. He does bring the aerial threat. He can drag defenders away, you know, on a cross, make some room for Benzema, et cetera. He can actually be a target. He can actually whip some good crosses in himself from the right. I think he would have been playing. I mean, it maybe it goes without saying and it might, might sound obvious, but I actually think he would be getting a significant amount of minutes if he was healthy this season, just given our right wing mm-hmm. situation and the fact that Rodrigo hasn't been 100% healthy. Um, yeah. Brazil. And uh, Bale, and Bale yeah. at the very, before we go that, like Bale at the very least, um, the thing is that I I feel that Asard always needed like this kind of movement and dynamism, but with Bale, even if he doesn't have the movement and the speed anymore, he has that left foot that can do a lot of things without hitting move. Like you just win the crosses, really good at striking the ball. So you can get, and that's the nice thing about Bale. Even if right now he cannot move, he's st- he could still be a kind of pro- he can still be kind of more productive than uh, than anyone we have in the right wing except the healthy rodrigo so so yes that's true so speaking of rodrigo obviously did not make the brazil national team and even if he was healthy and 100% it doesn't seem like he's been able to crack it yet uh we did have vinicius as a late late call up because of a uh, firmino injury and there was a bunch of controversy, uh, the fact that he wasn't called up. And, you know, I was looking at it and I was like, I think it's crazy. I think he's probably the most informed Brazilian player in the world right now, although Neymar has been having a good season. Um, but, you know, he maybe he hasn't fit in that well with the Brazilian national team. You also have Neymar on the left wing. 
he did come in at halftime for uh, for Fred. And I thought it was really encouraging because I honestly felt that without doubt, without question, that this was the most comfortable he's looked in the Brazilian national team shirt ever. Uh, he played like he he was just with Real Madrid freely out of his head, taking players on, very confident with his body language, dribbling was good, linking up with Neymar really well, which is also very encouraging. Um, so I was really, really, really encouraged by this Vinicius performance. He did have one pretty good chance where he plays a, you know, plays a nice vertical pass to Neymar out wide, and then sprints, gets the ball back on a one-two, goes in the break, and a heavy touch around the goalkeeper, and, and he's unable to kind of finish. But he was, he was pretty awesome. I actually thought basically he was the reason why Brazil went to another level in the second half. He, they everything dangerous went through him, so I was really encouraged with that. And most, mostly I was encouraged because I, I really liked the fact that he and Neymar together were able to coexist on the left and it looked really good, which gave me high hopes for the World Cup to see what TT can get out of that partnership. And, and they didn't get in each other's way. So my question to you guys is, and we can start with Mahedi this time. We've been getting a lot of questions on the podcast. Like, how do, how do you get Vinicius and Mbappe to coexist? And I don't think it's a huge problem. I, th- I Like, the main argument is, well, Mbappe's best position on the left. And I'm just thinking to myself, have we not been watching this dynamic for the last few years? Mbappe, you know, has been playing with Neymar, coexisting with Neymar for a long time now. I think it works mm-hmm. fine. He's been playing on the right wing for France on and off for quite a quite a bit of time as well. I think it's fine. I'm not too worried about it. Um, you know, maybe you could argue that Benzema, the fact that, he he tends to go to the left quite often too, maybe like the three of them. But I mean, we kind of see the different dynamics of that with France as well, which we're going to talk about France in the, in the second year. But are you worried about Vinicius and Mbappe coexisting or you think you think it's just going to be something that we can figure out pretty easily? I, I'm not I'm not worried about that at all. I think uh, uh, Benzema, st- like, Providing that uh, Mbappe arrives at some point in time where Vinicius is still here, of course. And uh, even if Benzema is here, I'm not worried about that either. I think Benzema and Mbappe are too good of players to not figure out how to coexist with Vinicius. And as you said, like uh, Mbappe has been coexisting with uh, with Neymar, uh, but we do have to, you know, keep this in mind that Neymar often plays uh, a central role or played a central role at PSG, which uh, Vinicius is yet to do for Real Madrid. But the thing with Vinicius is he's so young. Uh, we like he might end up being a complete striker, like Cristiano Ronaldo. We don't know that. Like that is that is the thing. Like he's he's still pretty. Raw, despite being this good, uh, that was my argument. Like over when when Rodrigo started uh, to play on the right for the first time for Real Madrid, people are saying like he always played uh, on the left for Brazil, and like he's primarily a left winger. We're probably ruining a good uh, left winger. My counter argument to that was always that mm, we're probably not. We may or may not be ruining a left winger at the same time we might be creating a good right winger as well uh, these players are too young to be constrained to positions like this I think and for that matter I don't think uh, Benzema or uh, Mbappe would have uh, anything on on Vinicius for his progress for that matter and uh, these players especially uh, Mbappe and uh, Benzema they roll around all over the place in the in the front line so it it would really not be a problem for Vinicius to still be uh, to still own his left flank because Mbappe and uh, Benzema can pretty much play everywhere on the, on the other side so no I'm, I'm not at all same here uh, and uh, uh, the thing is that yeah Mbappe will deliver for wherever you put him on the pitch uh, and and even from a system perspective so the thing that Mbappe has been doing a lot more lately is that he's having he's having greater impact with what he does with the ball but what he offers a lot to PSG these days is really good like he he's getting increasingly good at like carrying the ball from deeper zones uh and helping PSG progress like that and the thing is that Real Madrid already has that with Vinicius so I also don't think that we lose out 
my I put Mbappe on the right wing. I mean, it will be definitely the, it will take some of his impact, but at the same time, it could also be good in that you get to and in that you would get an Mbappe that's more focused on just end product and just finishing uh, uh, finishing in the box. So you have you, you you could have a team where say Benzema and Vinicius are the ones uh, in charge of getting the ball up from the from deep areas and then you have Mbappe making runs from the right and trying to finish those moves so it could be uh, I, I what I would envision is an Mbappe playing in from the right and making those kinds of runs and being more focused on finishing plays rather than uh, bringing the ball from deep like he's doing a bit more uh, with PSG these days and well, I'll, I'll just add a little bit up oh, so go, go ahead go, go ahead Kim Yeah, I would just add a little bit on that because, like, uh, the the brand of football that Real Madrid has been playing over the few weeks and a bit with Carlo Ancelotti right now is that we overload one side and then we try to switch play on the other. So if we are like overloading the left side with the Mendes, the Vinicius, is to have someone like Kylian Mbappe running relatively free on the right is is I'll, i'll sign anything for that so yeah I, i don't think i don't think that would be an issue at all and, and i completely agree with what what jose said about that yeah i mean a cross switch of play to mbappe could be as devastating as like these pop long passes to mbappe that complete that are basically a cheat code in international football yeah yeah i mean just the fact that just the thought of us sucking in defenders on one side playing that diagonal ball to Mbappe free on the other side is is a terrifying thing to defend really be, you know it's a huge upgrade over you know Lucas Vasquez getting the ball on that side um you know and, and Carvajal can exploit that pretty well but we haven't even seen much of him on the field so to have some presence on the right would be huge um this is a good transition to France and Benzema and Mbappe Jose I know you wrote about their massive win over Kazakhstan and one of the things i noticed you you wrote about was just the fact that um Benzema um you know he doesn't need to necessarily be the alpha guy at at France the way he is at Real Madrid because he you know he can he has Griezmann and Mbappe there they they all kind of can be interchangeable Griezmann and Mbappe can do a lot of link up play as well and i thought that was an interesting thing to know and i think Part of the reason why, I mean, if you fast forward to, since the inception, the re-inception of Benzema and the French national team and how well he's integrated already and how many goals he scored already, all that stuff. Um, I think it just seems a little bit smoother and smoother every game. And I think it's a lot of it is just Benzema have, has just calibrated and adjusted to what Deschamps requires of him from an offensive flow standpoint. And he's been able to be efficient without having to be the absolute chief facilitator. And I think that that's a good sign because if you think about the last time he was in the awful was really when Cristiano Ronaldo was here. And um, the, the, then it, he took a backseat with his goal score. But I don't think the problem was the fact that he wasn't the alpha. The problem was that it just seemed like he just wasn't as confident in front of goal. Whereas now he can play that role where he's not as, you know, is not as ball dominant, but still pop up and score a bunch of goals. I think this is a great sign. I just think he's more confident now than he was when playing with Ronaldo because with Ronaldo, he would still get a lot of chances. And we all, we've all, we all know that Ronaldo probably would have had a lot more assists had Benzema been able to score some of those chances that were set up for him. But um, talk to me about Benzema's role with the French national team and for, feel free to also pinpoint that it was Kazakhstan who, I, I only saw the highlights and it just seemed like they weren't defending. I don't know what the goalkeeper was doing half the time, but just made me more of a general point. How is he doing with the French national team? And how do you think that will translate to Real Madrid next season? Yeah. Uh, so I think you summarized it, the aspect of, like, of Benzema now being focused more on finishing and letting uh, Mbappé and Griezmann have uh, more of the ball. And uh, And again, I think, and I think it's it's quite interesting because I, I I guess that maybe four or five years ago we wouldn't have imagined Benzema in a role like this, just being the guy who finishes who finishes your attacking place. But that's very much what he's playing with France. Like there are times where maybe he doesn't have as much inf- like well he doesn't have nearly as much influence 
how France plays compared to compared to Real Madrid, he's always the, he's always he can, he's right now France's main finisher, I would say, uh, apart from Mbappe, of course. Uh, and that's and that's interesting. That's a role that right now it seems to be what France needs right now because. Uh, Right now, Mbappe being more ball dominant, more uh, involved in bringing the ball from deep. Uh, yeah, that's that's one of the big changes in how he's played in the last in the last two years or so. Uh, and he had that at just like what Benzema is doing right now at just well to the current versions of of Mbappe and Griezmann. Uh, they both. Uh, again, at for the first times uh, these uh, this trio played, it still felt a bit off, like they were stepping on each other's zones. But I think they are increasingly figuring it out. All in all, uh, ever since the Shams uh, switched to a back three in September, I really feel things uh, are working a lot better for France. The attack, they're still messy in defense, and it was really interesting to see these situations versus Kazakhstan, where uh, Kazakhstan could have had so much space to counter it, but they just don't have the players. And it's always, and it's, and if you're a, like a Kazakh player, it's probably not a nice thing to, uh, to try to do a counter when you have, when you have like Kante, Upamecano, uh, or Kunde r- running at you. So uh, they, in, in this case, they could snuff out counters really easily, but I still think France has, a lot of defensive weaknesses still and but i but the attack is getting better and it's getting more fun and it was nice uh, the the big adjustment that the shams did for this game is that instead of playing uh benjamin pavard at the as the right wing back uh he play he played coman and that made it a lot more fun. so out of those eight goals uh two were assisted by coman from the right two were assisted by teo hernandez and I, the, France is becoming a bit more fun to watch, which, yeah, it's something that we did not expect out of a Deschamps team. Yeah, I, it, I, I actually really enjoy when France is on the national team schedule now. It's, a, it's a really fun, fun thing to, to just witness and be and be a part of the spectacle. Um, Mehdi, any France thoughts, or do you want to move on? Uh, yeah, I think we can move on. I think Jose right. and you. All right, so we got to like the meat and potatoes of the podcast. I think what's left is uh, just a few notes on Austria. With all due respect to David Alaba, I, it just Austria is done and dusted. They're buried. They're not going to qualify for the World Cup. They can't even finish above third place. That was the case heading into a game against Israel, a game that they won four two, and um, Alaba was kind of just being Alaba. Um, really good crosses in this game. Some good set pieces struggled defending crosses and in fact was was in I think responsible for Israel's second goal where he just falls asleep defending a a a free header at the far post so that's that um Gareth Bale gets his 100th international cap for Wales Sam Sharp wrote about that on the website he wanted to join the podcast today but ultimately couldn't because it's 11 o'clock in UK and I think he just wants I, I assume he's just partying but that's probably a, maybe a, a, I don't know if that's true or not, but he just uh, couldn't make it. I would have been curious to know what his notes were for this game. Um, he does always sign up for Wales on the international break. I don't know what it is. He, he seems like really just love the Wales national team, but um, he did mark or point out in his article, and this was now widely reported and pretty common knowledge now that the only reason he came off at halftime was it was because it was a pre-planned substitution that he was going to come off at halftime. He did get an assist, although it was more of like just, you know, obligatory. We have to give him an assist because he was the last player to touch the ball. He made a little simple pass in midfield and then some like, you know, 10, 20 seconds later or whatever ended up in the back of the net. And now Wales go to the playoffs. So we just hope that Bale returns healthy that's the hope, I guess. Um, mm-hmm. And just hope that <laughs> it is, it's just so, it's, it's almost, I don't know, the laugh or cry. I mean, there, it's a running joke that he, he trains with Real Madrid and becomes healthy for the national team just in time. And, and it's like a half joke, but half cry for help because it just, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It, it ended up being true again. 
So we just hope he returns back healthy. I actually think he's someone we could definitely use this season at various points throughout mm-hmm. the, the campaign. And that actually concludes it. I mean, the last one on our list would have been Eduardo Camavinga, but he did not play in France U21's 7-0 win over Armenia. And so that we've come to an end, gentlemen. I think we got through all of that. It's awesome. Um, any concluding thoughts on this Sunday night? You, do you guys have any more games you have to cover for your national teams? I think France plays again, don't they? Uh, France plays on Tuesday against Finland. Uh, I'm not yeah. even sure what's in play at this point uh, for France. because Nothing for France. Yeah. So... Uh, uh, we'll see. We'll even see if, it, like, I for this one, I'd prefer if Benzema doesn't start. Okay. Uh, our guy needs some needs some rest. So uh, it it wouldn't surprise me if Deschamps just decide to play like the rest of the squad. The rest of the squad for this one. We'll we'll see. We'll see what happens. Yeah, I pre- I prefer Benzema to re- to rest this one out. Uh, we need it for the we need him for this uh, for this last part of the calendar year. Yep, and Croatia is uh, is done. I don't see any Croatia games games coming up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In the next next international break, I would want Portugal to face well so that it's the Real Madrid bicycle kick derby uh, in the playoffs. Uh, so <laughs> uh, that's that's probably something I'll look forward to for the next round. But yeah, Croatia is done for 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 this round. That'd be a juicy one. I mean, on one hand, I want all the best teams in the World Cup. On the other hand, I'd love to see some juicy playoff matches. It would be a ton of fun if we saw something like that. Plus Netherlands versus whoever. I, I don't know. Like, just put, I would be cool to see the big teams against each other in these playoffs. Um, other games, Great. I mean, the big one on Tuesday is Brazil-Argentina, which I don't think, I, I, I don't even know how much Argentina care, care about it. Uh, I mean, they ob- everybody else obviously cares about it's Brazil versus Argentina, but I just mean like Brazil have just flown through these qualifiers without even getting a dent uh, on them, mm-hmm. not a scratch on them. They're just unscathed. They're going to blitz through it. They're qualified. Casemiro is not going to play that game because he picked up a yellow against Colombia. Militao may or may not start. He hasn't been starting over Thiago Silva and Marquinhos, um, but Vinicius may get a start. Um, not that I'm too crazy about him getting playing time in that game, like that game, but. Uh, I mean, just one of the things watching Brazil, Colombia, and it's just a reminder, it's nothing new, but just the physicality, the challenges, the ref letting so much go. It's a bloodbath. Also, I don't know if you guys saw Neymar just chest bump the ref and get away with it. (laughs) Just crazy stuff. Um, uh, So, yeah, so I hope that Vinicius gets the night off. I also hope Benzema gets the night off and that you get the night off, Fozzi, in in that France game. Austria play against Moldova tomorrow. It's the most non-consequential thing. Uh, you know, we'll throw something up if Alaba does anything noteworthy. And yeah. Um, yeah. There is a part of me, though, that would like to see, that would like to start seeing Vinicius having like big game nights with Brazil. But yeah, right now, right now, Real Madrid cannot afford an injury to Vinicius because he got because Christian Romero gave gave him a kick in the <laughs> gave him a kick in, in the Argentina game so yeah uh the the less the less our play the less our guys play the better that's the reality yes yep, and I'm uh like I'm an Argentina fan it's always very weird for me cuz like half of the Real Madrid starting lineup is from Brazil now and so whenever it's Brazil versus Argentina it's really weird for me it's it's a bit better now now that Messi has left so that I don't have to like cheer for a for a Barcelona <laughs> legendary Argentina but even more so I don't want Vinicius to be playing against Argentina at the moment like win for me if Vinicius doesn't play yeah let's just bubble wrap everyone now get them back to the Madrid get them training um so we can just focus on La Liga again and this is why our, our fixture is pretty brutal after the uh after this break uh, fixtures are will get pretty difficult yeah we have a game pretty much every three to four days from once we get back until December 12th and then we do get yeah. a bit of a Christmas break, which is nice. And then, yeah, I just looking at the fig. Oh my God, Sevilla, Real Sociedad, Inter, Atleti. Yeah, that that four game stretch is insane. Oh. Yeah, and that's every th- and that's like every three for oh, like every th- three yeah. to five. It days. gets pretty wild. Well. November, Oof. December. 
that though there is only but what we haven't hit yet we don't even know about yet what, who we're going to play what it's going to look like but there is always one annual week from hell which is usually february or march which is like yeah. it's like barca champions league knockout bar, uh twice in, and it's all sandwiched in between so it's going to get worse it's almost going to get worse yes yeah, but hey, let's do more football. Let's put more games on the schedule. Let's do that World Cup every two <laughs> years. We need it. Uh, all right, gentlemen, it was a pleasure. Nice to have uh, the uh, the inception, the uh, the inauguration of this of this trio with Jose Mehedi and myself, and hopefully many more to come. Thank you guys for joining. Sure. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday and take care. Thanks, guys. All right. Take care, Jose. Take care, Kian. Take care, take care, guys. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Yes.